everyone. Hope you're all well today. We're just going to wait for a couple of minutes um, while people join in. Um, I hope you have your lunch ready to go and it's something delicious and tasty. Okay, I think we've got quite a few people online now. So that's excellent. Everyone's on time today. Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Steph Kershaw. I am a research fellow at the Matilda Centre for Research in Mental Health and Substance Use. And I'm also the project lead for Cracks in the Ice. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of Cracks in the Ice before, it's an online toolkit which is focused around uh, methamphetamine and providing information and resources for the community, health workers and family and friends. And it's my great pleasure today to welcome you to today's Cracks in the Ice webinar. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and culture. I'm currently on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Uh, and I further acknowledge um, the traditional owners of the country on which you are on uh, and pay respects to their elders past and present. So before um, I introduce today's speaker, I just wanted to let you all know a couple of things. Firstly, you are in listen-only mode, and that means that we can't see or hear you, uh, but you will notice that on your dashboard, you have a Q&A button, and this is where you can type in any questions that you have during the webinar or any concerns that you have and send them through to us. Um, and we will be having a dedicated um, question and answer section at the end of the webinar. Uh, if you haven't already um, seen the website, um, it's cracksintheice.org.au and today's webinar is being recorded and it will be made available uh, to watch on the Cracks in the Ice website at any time. So for today's um, presentation, oops, um, we are very lucky that this is part one of a two-part uh, webinar focused on demystifying methamphetamine use and finding a path to recovery. And both webinars will be presented by Tara Hurster, a registered psychologist who has over a decade of experience supporting people living with addiction and looking for change. And Tara also founded the Tara Clinic, um, which stands for Therapeutic Addiction Recovery Assistant. That was a lot of S's in uh, 2017, uh, where she supports busy and successful people wanting to regain control over substance use um, while leaving the guilt and shame behind. And over the years, Tara has worked closely with people who use methamphetamine to demystify the use and detox process and also provide clear and practical strategies and tools to help them reach their goals of lasting recovery. So thank you so much for joining us, Tara. We're really delighted to have you. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me with Cracks in the Ice. Um, well, I'm going to hand over to you now for part one, which we're starting with kickstarting recovery by knowing the stages of change. Um, over to you. Fantastic. All right. Let's just get this screen up and running. Now, Steph, if you can just confirm that you can see my screen shared. All looks good, Tara. Fantastic. All right. So I also want to just acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I'm coming to you from. And that's also the, the Gadigal people from the Eora Nation. Um, and yeah, I just really want to recognize them as the traditional owners of this land. Now, we are going to be doing a two-part webinar, and I'm really excited to be able to really go through today around understanding the stages of change and how your language actually is really quite intertwined with that. And then in the second part, which I believe is next week, um, part two is looking at how to choose the best recovery pathway uh, that's going to work for you in terms of the stage of change that you're at and also what your goals are. And we're going to also go through tips that you can sort of uh, learn to to know your way around that process. That is in part two. So make sure that you register for that because it is a separate registration to today. 
So yes, I'm Tara Herster. As uh, Steph outlined, I'm not going to go through my bio because she did a great job. However, I am really here in the area of addiction treatment because I believe that it's important to disrupt the way that society views addiction and engages in its treatment. And I do that through providing a modern solution to addiction recovery, similar to the way in which the cracks in the ice are really looking at addiction from a, a real modern approach. Uh, I also share my story of recovery and and my aim really is to make addiction treatment sexy. None of this stuck in the corner in a deep, dark rehab somewhere. No, we can actually talk about it in uh, a light filled and meaningful way. So that's really why I'm here. All righty. Now, we're going to start in, in a place that you're probably not going to expect, and that's talking about farts. <laughs> yes, I said it. I'm talking about farts. Now, if you think about uh, a time when you have been at a first date and you notice that your tummy's starting to gurgle and you're thinking, "Oh no, I've, I've I've got something brewing and this is really not okay," you don't want to you don't want to say anything, you don't want to excuse yourself. It's feeling really uncomfortable and confusing. That's the same thing that happens when you're experiencing addiction and you're meeting someone for the first time. There's so much shame. There's so much stigma. There's so much, uh, you know, real sort of separation and isolation in those moments. And part of what we need to do is we need to understand that often addiction is very easily hidden in the beginnings of relationships, though as time progresses, those who are close to you start to smell what the rock is cooking. <laughs> and that's where uh, quite often the people who are closest to you in your relationships are those who um, are seeing the, the impact of those addictions on you. And quite often they're the people who are most vocal with you about uh, their desire to help you with change. So I'd really love to help you to consider when the people who are closest to you are trying to help you to navigate your way towards a change process. Sometimes it can be helpful to listen to those people because more often than not, they're going to have your best interest at heart and they're also going to be moving away from the shame. Now, as it says here on the screen, shame and guilt bring you back to the pre-contemplation stage of change. And so that's all well and good uh, to say, but let's get into what the stages of change really are. Now, the stages of change are in the research and in the um, in, in the books, they talk about the five stages of change. And at the Tara Clinic, we've added a, an additional one, which we call recovery. And that's really where, as you can see in this uh, visual here, that's when you swing off the cycle and you're able to engage in your full, rich and meaningful life without being sort of kept up in the throes of addiction or the recovery journey. Now, a big thing that is a very common, normal, natural experience in the change process is experiences of lapses or relapse. Now, unfortunately, these terms, both lapses and relapses, they have quite negative sort of undertones to them. And so part of what happens with that is it breeds more shame and guilt. So we've actually changed the language of that. And in um, my talks in our webinars here, I'm also going to be using my language. So whenever I talk about a lesson, I'm referring to a lapse because a lapse is a fundamental aspect of your foundational learning. And as you can see here, the lesson can truly happen anywhere. Yet when you engage in a lesson, you tend to set step straight into the action stage of change and continue on your journey towards recovery. When we experience a relapse, that terminology is so often linked to shame or guilt or this sense of giving up or failure. So instead, we call it recycling. And that just simply means that we've popped ourselves back into this cycle here, which is those earlier stages of change. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing bad about it. It just is. Right. So as you can see up here, relapse or recycling can happen anywhere. And the way that you can tell whether you've had a lesson or you've recycled is where you find yourself in the stages of change afterwards. So let's get into the different stages of change. 
So here in the pre-contemplation stage, this here is sort of that first stage of the change process. Now, sometimes people call it denial, but really there's two main sort of aspects to the pre-contemplation stage. Either one, you have no intention to change or you don't see it as a problem right now, or there's this sense of sort of helplessness or hopelessness. You know, you feel that there's no solution. So there's really no motivation to try, right? Shame and guilt bring us back to the pre-contemplation stage. So when you feel that the way in which to overcome a lapse or a relapse is to, uh, you know, start hitting yourself over the back with your words and your thoughts and your beliefs about how, um, how much of a failure you are or all of those things, all that does is actually bring us back into this first stage of change. Rather than sitting in uh, shame and guilt, we want you to be moving closer to these stages of change and we'll get there in a moment. But by sitting in shame and guilt, we are basically stopping ourselves. We're putting a barrier between ourselves from being able to make change. So that's why we want to move away from the shame and the guilt and stigma, which is what's so awesome about cracks in the ice. All right, so once we've moved through from pre-contemplation, we move off over to contemplation, as you can see here. So contemplation is sort of like what it says on, this, on the screen there. You're starting to notice that there is a problem, though you're not really ready or sure if you want to change or you're not really... Um, sure if you want to sort of start looking around at your options there's really that sense of like yeah look I get it but you know not yet or not now or it's a bit hard okay this is again there's nothing wrong with this stage there's nothing bad about this stage and there are certain aspects to your treatment that you can do to help you move through the stages of change that are going to be most effective at this stage. Now, again, as I said, part two is where we talk about the pathways towards recovery. And so I'm going to be kind of hinting at this throughout this webinar. The answers to those questions are going to come in the next one next week. So once we've moved through the contemplation stage, and remember, it's not linear, so it doesn't mean that you need to go back to the beginning like snakes and ladders, okay, when we experience a lesson. This is sort of, some, it's uh, designed to kind of look like a spiral, right? Each time you progress, you're moving up the chain, okay? You don't come straight back down to the bottom when you've had a lapse or even recycled because everything that you've learned and practiced on your way up the journey has also remained with you. And it means that you're starting the next step from sort of further ahead or further along the journey. The next stage of change is the preparation stage. And this is really where you start to look at your options. You realize that there's a problem. You're open to looking for recovery options that might be uh, available to you. And you may have even started some of those treatment options. Maybe you're going to a, a group or a meeting, perhaps you're going to therapy, or you might even be in rehab. Though the difference between preparation and action in this stage is that in preparation, you might just be ticking the box. So you might be there doing the thing, listening to the thing, but it's that implementation that's not really there, right? That's really where preparation sits. Again, as you continue to move through, you'll start to see that the coloring changes. So pre-contemplation is the darker color, okay? It's more intensity of your addiction is present. Then as you get to the contemplation, things start to sort of lighten up a little bit. And again, we're moving into preparation, which is a lighter color again. However, you'll notice that there's a big difference between the coloring from preparation to action. And that's because this is actually the riskiest junction in the whole process of change. This is because it's the first time where you are actively stepping outside of your comfort zone. 
And because we're stepping outside of our comfort zone, by definition, it will feel uncomfortable. And part of what the, do I have my little brain here? Yes. Part of what happens with the brain is when we feel uncomfortable, this whole part of the front of our brain, our logical system switches off because we think we're being eaten by a tiger. And I know it sounds dramatic, but that's our brain. Our brain is dramatic and it's, I just think of bold and the beautiful. <laughs> That's really what's happening in our brain. Anytime we feel a trigger, we feel a craving, we feel an urge, or we start to see positives in our life coming in, our brain perceives that just like a tiger that's trying to eat us. Now, inside your comfort zone, when you're in this cycle of addiction, quite often can be represented by some of those words that are inside your comfort zone on the screen right now. Things like anxiety or lying or unhealthy relationships or arguments or just simply being drug affected, right? These are the things that are inside our comfort zone. We might not like them, though our brain knows what to expect from them. They're predictable. We know what it feels like to use. We know what it feels like to be in an argument. We get it, okay? What we're wanting to move towards is things that are often outside your comfort zone. Things like happiness and healthy relationships and savings, right? All of these things are what we're wanting to work towards, yet because they're outside of our comfort zone, even though they're quote unquote positive things, our brain doesn't know what to expect from them. So often thinks that they're a tiger. And so it engages in its own safety mechanism to bring you back to your comfort zone because, well, we haven't died there yet. So that must be a safe place. Even though it's not logical, it's the way that the brain has developed. And so what are the brain's safety mechanisms? Self-sabotage. This little guy here, all these arrows are those things that you tend to notice you do as you start shifting away from addiction that then bring you back to it. Okay. And this cycle, that's why I'm talking about this junction, this junction between preparation and action is almost like a dance. You start to learn how to dance with yourself, with your experiences of discomfort. And the biggest thing that we teach is early recovery, which is the first 12 months of change, is all about learning, pay attention, how to feel comfortable with the discomfort of feeling well. Let me say that again. Early recovery is learning how to feel comfortable with the discomfort of feeling well. And that is so often why shame and guilt and judgment comes around lessons and recycling because people are going, oh, I was feeling so good. Why on earth did I do this to myself again? Well, this is where we need to kind of lean in and say thank you to our brain for engaging in its version of a safety mechanism because it thinks that you're, you're about to be eaten by a tiger. So what you want to be doing is learning how to engage in the, the comfortability inside the discomfort. And that is part of what we start to really implement in action. So action is the first stage on this other color. This is really where the rubber hits the road, right? This is where you're taking those steps towards change. You're really implementing those practical tools and strategies. And you're noticing that you're starting to experience some change really occurring, both internally in your environment and also with your relationships. Now, sometimes in action, this is where people start to lose some friends and that can feel really hard, especially when your group of friends or the people that you spend a lot of time with are often uh, in amongst the addiction world. When we start to separate ourselves, quite often it can feel isolating. It can feel confronting. It can feel confusing. And these are big triggers for 
lessons. So part of what we want to be doing is thinking about, okay, how can I start to build my full, rich and meaningful life so that where I'm walking towards is also exciting and filled with the people and the things that we want to be uh, surrounding ourselves with. Now, maintenance in the, the research and the literature is the final stage of change. However, like I said, I, uh, I've added an additional stage on there because maintenance, I don't really feel is the end of the road because maintenance is, sure, we're building a full, rich and meaningful life, yet you're still continuing to do the practice. It's something that we still need to be actively aware of. And we're starting to look at patterns in our behavior. When I think about my experience of the maintenance stage, maintenance probably occurred for about four years for me to then start to see the patterns of my uh, uh, experience of lessons occurring um, with regards to when I would smoke cigarettes. And I noticed that when I was actually... Um, in uh, emotional distress or if I was feeling time poor, those were the times where I noticed that I would smoke cigarettes. When I realized that pattern in the maintenance stage, I was able to lean in and actively uh proactively change the, the, the circumstance around that. So when I was feeling emotionally distressed, instead of, you know, um, leaning on cigarettes, I lent in with compassion and I gave myself some love. So when I did that, I noticed that the next time I experienced emotional distress, I was no longer feeling compelled to go for a packet of cigarettes. Instead, I felt more compelled to go in with compassion for myself. The same for being uh, time pressured. I was able to put in some strategies to make things more proactive in my life, which meant that I didn't experience those feelings of um, time pressure anymore. And once I engaged with that and I had the time to really see those patterns, I then moved into recovery. And that is where I fully redefined my identity. Okay, and that's what you can do too. You can redefine the nature of your relationship to stress, to emotional distress, to uh, substances, and to uh, building relationships as well. You, you, while you still will experience triggers or cravings, they just don't phase you anymore because you know what they are and you're effectively managing them in a lifestyle, so style of living way. And when you're experiencing that full, rich and meaningful life, you've created a space that you don't feel the need or desire to escape from. So therefore, we're no longer looking for those quick fixes. Instead, we're enjoying the process of continuing to build our life the way that we want to live. So that's how you go through the stages of change. And as I mentioned, at each of those stages, you're going to notice a different, um, a, a different aspect of yourself and a, a, a different sort of um, starting point for your recovery journey. And so, okay, yep, great. What do I do now? Well, the next thing for you to do is really look at what stage of change you're in. And a really, really great way of doing that is starting to pay attention to your language. Now, I'm a bit of a wordsmith and I really, really love paying attention to words. And I noticed that uh, in particular, when we use 100% words like always or never or everything or nothing, these can be quite impactful words for us to use. So, you know, how do words really change things? Try this exercise. Give yourself a moment. If you're in an environment where you feel comfortable literally saying this out loud, I'd encourage you to, to pause, take a breath, notice how you're feeling, and then say out loud, I have always struggled with this. Notice what your feelings are. Notice how your body feels. Notice what thoughts come up. You might be feeling defeated, you might be feeling maybe some shame or some guilt, right? All those things that take us to the pre-contemplation stage of change. I've 
always struggled with this. Now, pause, breathe, and say, in the past, I've struggled with this. How does that feel? What comes up in your body? What comes up in your mind? Using past tense is one of the quickest and simplest ways of helping you to move towards the next stage of change. Because remember, now is the past for now. And now is also the past for now. <laughs> right? Time is continuing to move forward. It's one of those things that just happens. Okay? And when we're talking about our experience of addiction or our experience of challenge, we can always, I know I said we don't use 100% words, however, in this situation, I'm going to give myself a pass. Um, we can always speak in the past tense. So I can say, oh, uh, you know, in the past, I've really struggled to uh, reduce how much I'm using. That just by saying that, even if you are thinking, well, no, that's how I feel now. Yes, that's okay. We can still talk about it in past tense because what it does is it gives the brain an opportunity to think, oh, so that was my past. That means that the future could be different. It leaves a little side gate open for, for you to kind of go, huh, okay. If in the past that's been a struggle, maybe something could be different in the future. And the, the way in which we utilize our language really impacts on the direction that you go. So if we sit in that, I always struggle with this, always means future, right? So from now till the end of time, it is simply not even an option. Whereas when we utilize past tense, we start to open, as I said, that side gate of going, well, you know what? Maybe there might be a different opportunity in the future. So I'm a bit of a happy hippie. So I think about things in terms of a tree. And this tree is the representation of how all of your, your thoughts, your beliefs, your actions, your feelings, and all of those things come together in a, a simple diagram here. So in the roots of the trees, when you think about a tree outside, you don't see the roots because they're usually under the ground. And that's our belief systems, our core beliefs are the roots of our trees. Now, if we have unhealthy or unhelpful root systems of a tree, then the tree itself isn't going to be very sturdy or healthy. Same with us. If we have unhelpful or unhealthy core beliefs, then the trunk, our thoughts, aren't going to be very sturdy. And the leaves, which is our words, they're not going to feel look very lush or, or vibrant. Then if we think about our actions and our outcomes, the fruit on that tree, they're not going to really be very helpful or nourishing or, or vibrant or exciting or sweet, okay? And when we have an unhealthy root system, an unsturdy trunk, leaves and fruits that can be withering away, even a small puff of wind, which is our feelings, can topple that tree all the way over. So part of what we want to be doing is we want to be thinking, okay, well, how do I nourish my tree of life? How do I do this? How do I help my tree to be able to withstand any feelings that might come my way? And I feel that one of the most valuable ways to start that journey is by focusing on your words. And that's because if you think about a tree, okay, the tree gains its nourishment from the sun through its leaves. 
So it feeds the roots of its tree. Your words feed your beliefs more than you know. Our words truly matter because what you say is a direct representation of either what we're thinking or how we're thinking. And how we're thinking and what we're thinking is the mirror and is informed by our beliefs. And so our actions and outcomes come as a result of those three things. So my encouragement to you is to slow down with your language. Take a big, deep breath before you actually speak. And when you do speak, say what you're really meaning, what you really want to say. Ask the question assertively, express your needs clearly and set boundaries effectively. And that happens from slowing down. Now, when it comes to, all right, well, what words do I say? I often encourage people to look at a wheel of emotion. Now, this is the one we use at the Tara Clinic in our programs. However, you can easily look up a wheel of emotion um, through, uh, through Google, okay? T literally just type in uh, emotion wheel or emotion words wheel or emotion flower. That one sometimes comes up and you can see something similar. Now, what you'll notice in the center here are very generic words, okay? Sad. All right. <laughs> like, what do you want me to do with sad? You could be experiencing feelings of hopelessness or you could be feeling rejected. And hopelessness and rejected if someone came to you and said, oh, I'm feeling hopeless or and someone else came to you and said, I'm feeling rejected, your advice or your encouragement to them are going to be two very different things. But if that person came to you and said, I'm feeling sad, it's very hard to gain guidance of what to do next. So the more specific you can get with your feelings words, with your language, you want to be moving towards these outer rims of the, uh, of the wheel because it gives you more mm, evidence and more instruction as to what actually needs to be done or what action can be taken or what questions need to be asked in order to gain the the, the outcome that you're actually after. So when we're slowing down with our language and we're getting super specific on how we're feeling, then it allows us to start moving forward in a much more valuable way. So you might be thinking, all right, great, thanks. But how do I use this? Like, what, what is this actually going to do for me? Part of what you can do is you can listen to the language that you that you use around your experience of addiction or any behavior change that you're looking at and you will start to notice what stage of change you're in. Now, as I mentioned, in the next part, we're going to go through which sort of treatment program might fit each stage of change. So to help you identify your own stage of change, let's get into some of the language you might hear at different stages of change. So in the pre-contemplation, remember, this is that sort of center part here, things like, oh, I'm not as bad as old mate over there, or it's too hard to stop, or nothing works for me, or I've tried everything and it doesn't work. Those sorts of sentences or thoughts or feelings are going to be very indicative of the pre-contemplation stage. There's nothing wrong with that. It just is. And part of what you can start to do to help yourself shift from pre-contemplation to contemplation is to start asking yourself questions. Right. If you've noticed that you're saying a lot of always and nevers and everyone's and everything's, start thinking about it in terms of percentages. Is there 100% of the time that being the truth? Or was there maybe 1% of the time where there was something that went to the contrary of what you're thinking? 
Then when you get to the contemplation stage, you might be hearing things like, yeah, I know I use too much, but it's not that bad. Right? Or oh, I'm really busy now. I'll, I'll deal with it when I have more time. Okay. These are some of the things where you'll start to see, oh, hang on. The, like you can hear it. There's, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement that there might be an issue, though I'm just not ready to really do much about it yet. And that's okay. That's part of the stage of change. And so part of what you can help yourself to do to shift towards the next stage is, again, start asking yourself some questions. Things like, okay, um, what, what would you like your life to look like if you could wave a magic wand and wake up tomorrow and everything was the way that you wanted it to be? Would it still look like this? Or would we see something different, even if it's a small difference? And start looking at, okay, that difference that I would like to see in that magic life that I'm waking up into, how does the way that I'm living today line up with that? Is it likely that if I keep doing this that I will end up there? Or will I continue down the path that I'm on at the moment? And when you start to sort of challenge yourself and start asking yourself those clarifying questions, you'll start to notice that your language starts to change. So you might hear in the preparation stage that idea of, you know, like, yeah, I get it. I haven't done it yet, but I've get it. Right. So it might be um, that you've started to look for options that are available to you. We just haven't necessarily reached out to them yet. Right. Or you know, this is so hard, when will it get easier? That is showing that there is hope for change, that things aren't going to stay the same way all the time, and that there is this desire for progression, right? Um, uh, and, you know, things like it's not fair that I have to do all this work and other people don't. And, yeah, it sucks. Yet at the same time, we can also look at it and go, huh, how many people do the level of self-development and growth that is required in addiction treatment? And imagine the life that you can build for yourself on the other side of this. It's, it's kind of exciting. <laughs> well, I get excited about this. Then when we're in action, you'll start to hear language like, oh, you know, I tried that tool and it helped in this situation, but how would it work in another situation, right? You're starting to notice that you're asking questions that are more um, uh, sort of integrating the implementation. You're really starting to kind of identify that uh, through practice and repetition, things are starting to change. So I've noticed a pattern in my cravings. What can I do differently next time? So maybe you start noticing that when you're with Bob at the pub on a Thursday afternoon, there's more likely to be a really big craving. So maybe if we want to still meet up with Bob on a Thursday afternoon, perhaps we go for a hike. Or if Bob is probably not a helpful person to spend time with, maybe we go to a networking event on a Thursday afternoon instead and meet new people. Um, and, you know, other things like when I stopped meditating last week, I noticed I had more cravings than before. So you're starting to see, oh, when I become complacent and stop doing the helpful stuff, then more of the uh, the addictive style behaviors and triggers and things start to come back up. And part of what you're doing is you're helping yourself to build more evidence towards where you're wanting to go. You're creating change talk rather than sustain talk. And when we lean into change talk, looking at what the future can hold and how that can help us move forward, it is a, a very valuable aspect to shift you towards the next stage of change. And so that next stage of change is maintenance, right? You'll hear language like, life is feeling so much easier now. I haven't noticed any cravings in ages. And I've got so much time, energy and money and I can just do what I want. This is what maintenance feels like. And it is not the end of the road because over time you will start to notice either complacency will kick in or uh, patterns will pop up that take time to experience. And 
you know, little blind spots that you perhaps weren't aware of in yourself will, again, have the opportunity to pop up. And because we're feeling confident in our competence of creating change, of managing distress, that means that we are able to handle these things in a more effective way and continue to move forward to the final stage of change. And that stage is recovery, where we have swung off the cycle and you've completely redefined the nature of your relationship with that substance or behavior. So you'll hear language like, oh, my day felt really stressful, so I'm going to go for a walk and then I'll chat with you about it. So that's showing, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging how I felt and I'm acknowledging what the problem is. I'm, I'm stating a boundary that I'm going to go and support myself first by going for a walk. And then I'm going to connect with someone that's helpful in my community and talk it through. Right? That is what recovery looks like. It's just how we live life. That's just how life can be. And uh, again, there's no shame or guilt or fear around the addictive behavior or addiction in general. So you might even find you, you'll hear yourself saying, actually, I used to use methamphetamine. That's not a part of my life now. Rather than, oh, I no, like I can't use it. I can't use it. Well, you don't want to. You've made that choice now. You're engaging in this new lifestyle that uh, allows you to feel um, comfortable in your recovery. Now, your experience of recovery is yours, okay? It has nothing to do with a, a sense of abstinence or anyone else's goals for you. They are your own goals. So for some people, it might be managed use and for other people, it might be full abstinence, all of which is okay. It's about you finding what is the most effective uh, and, and um, full, rich and meaningful life style, so style of living, that you want for your life. Now, there is uh, uh, this a uh, resource that I have developed and um, Cracks in the Ice has this uh, accessible on their website. However, if you would like to grab this now, feel free. Just simply click, uh, scan the QR code and it will take you to the free resource hub. In the free resource hub, you'll see some mini courses on how to understand what addiction is and some real practical tools and strategies to manage it in the short term. You'll also get what is recovery, which is a three part mini series that outlines all the different recovery options and funding methods and treatment styles and all those things, as well as, again, some helpful strategies and tools for you to help yourself move towards recovery. And also you'll have access to our, um, uh, our cravings management course, as well as a brief uh, bonus video on understanding the brain. Because when you understand your brain, you'll understand your body more effectively and those feelings won't feel so scary when you're stepping outside your comfort zone. So um, the next slide is our questions slide. However, Steph, would you like me to keep it on this or would you like to uh, move it across? Um, thanks so much, Tara. That was amazing. I really appreciate you walking us all through the stages of change and um, what language can be helpful um, in each of those. Um, I think let's just leave this here for a couple of minutes and then, um, yeah, we can um, stop sharing. Uh, we've had lots of questions come through. So um, to get started with, I guess some people are wondering around the stages of change and the sort of time that it takes. Do you progress quickly through those stages of change? Is it a slow progression? Um, is there sort of like a expected timeline, I guess? That is such a common question. And I'm actually really excited that we're still sharing. So I'm about to change the screen, everybody, last second. <laughs> we have also provided the link in the chat as well. Fantastic. So let me scoot back to where we see the full here. So, okay. Actually, that's a bit disruptive. Wait, there we go. All right. 
So I am regularly receiving this question about how long does it take to go through each of the stages? The short answer is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and it all depends on you in terms of A, how much activity you put into moving through the stages of change. Um, however, if I really think of my own example, which I think is probably the only one I can really talk to because I lived it, I was in the pre-contemplation stage of change probably for about, hmm, probably from maybe year eight until, uh, so how old are you there, 14 to 16. So before 14, I didn't even realize that I was uh, sort of pushing back on people because pre-contemplation, you really start noticing that you're pushing back on people. If you want to call pre-contemplation from the beginning of the addictive behavior, then I would have been in pre-contemplation from year six, which was when I started. So I was like, I don't know, 11 until sort of 16. So pre-contemplation is just however long it is for you. Contemplation, I noticed that I had wrinkles on my lips and I wasn't happy about that. And that well and truly threw me into the contemplation stage. <laughs> it was like, whoa, hang on a minute. I'm, you know, uh, 15, 16 years old and I've got wrinkles on my lips. I don't like that. However, I wasn't ready to change. Moving into preparation, so that would so so contemplation probably was like year nine ish. Um, year ten and year eleven was really where I noticed that I started moving into the preparation stage, and that was when I started to move away from the friends group that I wasn't really aligning with anymore. Though I still kept going back to them to have cigarettes each day, though I wasn't spending as much time with them, and. When I moved into the action stage, I was probably there from, so I, I, this junction occurred in the middle of my HSC trial exams. Um, and I would say that I was probably in the action stage for about um, a year or so. And then maintenance was about four years. And then once I moved through that into recovery, I actually forgot that I was in recovery and that I had lived with an addiction for almost a decade. Like I literally forgot until a year and a half ago. <laughs> I was like, oh, in a second, I can talk about my own experience here. So um, it, it sounds like a long process. However, the, the reality is, is that I was doing that all sort of on my own and I was doing it with my own intuition and accessing the resources that I had around me without really realizing what I was doing. When you're being guided by a professional or a service that really understands how to help you move through those stages, uh, you can probably expect to shift through each of the stages, maybe, um, you know, moving from contemplate uh, contemplation into preparation you might oops you I might notice that that'll take about I don't know six months then preparation might be another six months then action you might be in there for about a year and then you move into maintenance and so that's why the research shows that between 12 to 18 months of active work in recovery is the best predictor for lasting change because when you're actively working through this process for a good 18 months, you've got a really nice um, foundation to, to enter into maintenance and continue on that journey as well. Yeah, okay, great. And what if you are someone who's um, supporting the person during these stages? So not necessarily going through um, the process yourself, but what if you're a health worker or just a family member? Is there certain things that you can do to support people, particularly in the pre-contemplation or contemplation stage? Mm. Uh, talking to clinicians first, um, motivational interviewing and Socratic questioning are two of the most valuable tools, clinical tools that you can use to support someone to start progressing from pre-contemplation to contemplation and then into preparation. What that means in human speak is <laughs> we're looking at, all right, uh, we're asking questions in a meaningful and curious way 
with non no judgment. We don't wear our judgment pants, right? We just wear our reality pants. Uh, we're asking questions of the person to help them to start seeing the the contrasts in their life of what they think is real to what actually is occurring. And this isn't about um, psychosis. That's something very different. But what I mean is in terms of if I think, oh, I don't have a problem, I can stop whenever I want. And someone says, okay, um, I'm, I'm interested to know when, when you tried stopping before. Mm. And then you say, oh, well, you know, it was a couple of months ago. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm curious to hear how that went for you. Oh, it didn't really work. Oh, what do you think got in the way? Oh, I met up with whoever and I saw whatever. And then the, the question, the, like the, con the conversation can kind of flow in that way because what it's doing is it's creating what's called cognitive dissonance. It's a difference between what we think is true to what is actually true. And I often talk about myself in terms of being a mirror in front of someone to help you see the, the reality of what's going on. And that's part of what uh, motivational interviewing and Socratic questioning can really do very valuably. Yeah, that, that's really helpful to know. And I know there are resources out there, including on Cracks in the Ass, around how to start a conversation and sort of using those open questions. Um, and I guess one of the other things, um, so if you are a, a family member in that um, and you're looking for guidance other than visiting a sort of the website, what would be a good place to go, like a, a general practitioner or would it be worth seeking help yourself? If you're a family member? Yeah. <clears throat> well, okay. So there are, sadly, there's a little bit more limitation as to what is available for family and friends of people who are wanting to help someone. However, what you can do and what I regularly recommend is to uh, go to a smart recovery meeting. Now, smart recovery is a wonderful free uh, uh support service it stands for self-management and recovery training and basically it's looking at how do we engage in the change process and how do we use cognitive behavior therapy so cbt to move towards that and it's a beautiful place for people to go who are wanting to understand the change process and that is a really great place that that family and friends can go to learn to understand to explore to and you know perhaps one day the person that you're wanting to support might come with you and that's great too so I would definitely recommend smart recovery um, another really really uh, valuable option for people who are supporting others is actually having support yourself individually. So going to see a therapist yourself, whether that's counselor or a psychologist, um, or, you know, if you're in a rural community, that might be your GP, uh, you know, until you can get access to some telehealth services. Though it's a really great thing because there is a fine line between supporting and enabling. And even with our best intentions, we can still be enabling someone rather than supporting them. And so by you learning how to set your own boundaries, how to be really clear with your boundaries, how to communicate assertively, how to um, communicate effectively as well and manage your experience of, you know, whether there's resentment or anger or whatever it is, going through that yourself helps to remove that from the conversation when you're speaking with your loved one, which is helpful in removing our judgment pants <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah thanks for that and I think also smart recovery may have um a family and pro friends program specifically these days now yes I um which might right. be helpful um thanks for that uh I think we're moving sort of backwards and when we're thinking about our own recovery um someone's asked a question around how do you sort of manage your recovery when you have children so if not necessarily being able to see them or talk to them um, you know, are there any sort of tips around, you know, managing your relationship with your child, I guess, during that stage? Okay. There is an extremely wonderful uh, organisation. It's, 
Oh, it just changed its name. Now, I'm not sure which one it changed it to. <laughs> but if you if you look up either parents parenting beyond breakup or I think it's parent I think they've changed it to parent parenting beyond breakup. So there's mums in distress and dads in distress. They used okay. to be two separate organizations and they've now brought it together and I'm pretty sure it's called parenting beyond breakup. And it's a a, a group as well as a phone service that you can contact and they are uh, manned or, you know, held by people um, who are experiencing that or have experienced that themselves. And they have really great resources and guidance around how to parent from afar, whether that's because of substance use and that that's the reason that the children have been removed from your care, et cetera. Um, And I think part of, again, taking off your judgment pants and putting on your reality pants, it's important to remember that when the, the most important situation when it comes to a child is to ensure that they are always cared for by a safe and sober adult at all times. And sometimes the parent is unable to provide that. And that's not necessarily a bad thing about that parent. It's just the reality of now. And that means that the the children do need to be supported by a safe and sober adult, which means that um, you you're actually helping yourself and the children by being in this situation right now so the most effective thing you can do is really actively start making those steps towards progressing through those stages of change and not trying to jump back into the kids lives too early because Mm -hmm. remembering in that junction between preparation and action it's very volatile and we want to create stability for children so I would be encouraging the, um, you know, maybe writing letters to them or having phone calls or those sorts of things until you're well into the action stage, because then you're more likely to be able to cope with the the, the stresses and the strains of the goodbyes um, and yeah. also the time when you're not with them. So we don't want to rush back into things too early and then have to kind of backpedal again. Yeah, that sounds um, very practical. Mm -hmm. Um, And we've also sort of had a question from a health worker around how they can support, um, you know, a parent who's going through that stage. Um, And I think, you know, reaching out to those resources that you spoke about, um, it looks like Rob has very kindly tracked it down and it is Parents Beyond Breakup. (laughs) Thank you. Thanks, Rob. one question that's also come up is around sort of what if it is your child who has um, the issue with drugs and you they are in the recovery but you've sort of caught them with um, drugs or materials used um, to take drugs. How do you talk or what's a good way to open a conversation about that? Mm. Uh, <clears throat> this is going to be very dependent on the relationship you already have fostered with the with the child um, and also uh, how that sort of catch has has occurred right um, though what I would say in a general sense is we as parents it's our job to manage our feelings first that's not our child's job So if we're feeling angry or frustrated or all of that, we need to handle that ourselves and de-escalate and regulate our own emotions. So that's why having a therapist yourself can be so valuable because you can learn how to do that. When you are engaging in that conversation, I do believe that that Cracks in the Ice also has a resource that outlines how to have the conversation with a young person. Um, I, I saw that recently. Though what you can do is you can you, you can simply sit with them when you're driving in the car, have them in the front seat with you. So there's no eye contact because eye contact can be very, very confronting. Sit with them in the car and, and just be super frank and curious and gentle in the conversation. So we might ask something like, hey, mate, um, I know we spoke about me not being in your room, though I did need to go in there to get X, Y, and Z. Like be reasonable about why you went in there, right? And then say, 
when I was there, I noticed X, Y, and Z, and I'd really love to have a chat with you about it and then see how they respond. They might be like, oh, no, 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 it's whoever's and then go, okay, cool. So um, are they a helpful person to be spending time with? Yeah. Right. Or if they do say, yeah, you know what, I had a, I had a slip or I had a whatever, then we can go, okay, well, what did we learn? What wasn't going so well in the lead up to that, that would help uh, us to implement now so that we can make changes. When's your next appointment with X, Y, and Z? How about we, we move that forward? Would you like me to come with you to your next session? Yeah. How about we go to a smart meeting, depending on how old they are? Um, you know, yeah. like, yeah, and you can start to kind of do this. Another really, really great thing, just quickly, I'm mindful of the time for everybody. Me too, but it's, yeah, Sorry. it's really <laughs> um, But another really great thing that I regularly recommend people to do is actually get your mobile phone, put it on loudspeaker, call the ADIS, uh, ADIS phone line, so um, the Alcohol and Drug Information Service. They are nationwide, 24-7, free phone line. Have them on loudspeaker and go, I've noticed this and I'd really love for us to have an open conversation about it because then you've got a mediator that's trained to be able to support the conversation between parent and child while also having a, an unbiased third party that can keep everyone yeah. in check and can give some guidance around what the best next steps might be. Yeah. Okay, great. That sounds um, really helpful. I'm conscious that we have run out of time, but this isn't the last time that we will see Tara. So if you didn't get your question answered, feel free to either email it through to us or hold it over until next week when we will be going through part two, uh, which will be focused on how to choose the best recovery path and top tips to know about the process. And that'll be held in exactly a week's time. So Tuesday, 15th of October at 12 p.m. Um, and yes, if you have any questions between now and then, please reach out to us. Um, if today's presentation has raised any concerns for you or you would like to talk to anyone, uh, there are support lines available on both Cracks on the Ice and the Tara Clinic uh, websites. And we will also be uh, holding future webinars along with part two in the future. So if you want to keep up to date, uh, please subscribe to our mailing lists and um, the slides and recording of today will be available. So thank you all for joining us and special thanks to Tara um, for part one. Looking forward to part two next week <laughs> and hope you all have a wonderful rest of the day. Thank you. Thanks.